Mariana, very much for your really inspiring um, words to kick us off. Mariana set us the challenge, and now it's for us to respond to that. Now, I'm particularly delighted to be chairing this session um, for two main reasons. One, as Maria Mariana has mentioned, I used to work in the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills here, and so I have a really deep interest in these policy issues. But secondly, I also worked at McKinsey for 10 years, and I came to see the world not as um, agents with perfect rationality and foresight, but actually with agents with a lot of um, biases in terms of the way they act, and the world is a complex adaptive system. And in my view, policy making has not caught up with the reality of how the world works. And if it doesn't, then we're going to have ineffective policy. And that, on the other hand, is not good news either for citizens or for taxpayers. So I'm delighted to be hearing from um, a really world-class panel of experts and practitioners today about some of these issues. Um, before I get into my introductory remarks, I just wanted to explain to you briefly how the session's going to work. So I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, a little bit less. Uh, we are running a little bit late, so we're all going to want to stick to our time frame. Um, each of the speakers is going to speak for about 10 minutes from their own experience. We are then going to have a response from Dan for about 15 minutes, and then we've got about 20 minutes or so for questions, discussion, interaction with the audience, which I will chair, but no doubt the, um, you know, lots of people want to join in. So the purpose of my introductory remarks is really to provide a sort of background frame and give some examples from my own experience um, and set up the discussion here. And so what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is really talk about four key messages and then set up some questions that I hope and know that the panel here will start to address. The four key messages are that innovation is a huge, big deal, um, on par with some of the really big macro issues that we're grappling with at the moment. Um, that innovation is a complex process and a system, and so solutions must be systemic, that governments, whether they like it or not, have a role to play. And finally, that for them to play that role effectively, they really do need to change the mindset and the underlying frameworks that often drive policy making. So let me start off with the first, innovation is a huge big deal. Now, you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe it, so I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on it, but it's kind of obvious if the, if the two ways to increase output, and as Andy said yesterday, it's not just about output, but that actually does drive living standards, are to increase inputs or increase productivity, um, then in a lot of the developed countries, for sure, um, there is not an option of increasing the inputs, and therefore we must focus on productivity. And we know from lots of research that productivity is driven by technological progress, it's driven by innovation, it's driven by doing things better and differently. Um, and even though that's incredibly hard to measure and quantify, and the numbers could be very volatile, there are estimates of up to 50% of labour productivity growth here in the UK having been driven by either total factor productivity or intangibles investments, both of which are very Key, you know, involved in the innovation system process and the way we think about it. Now, the problem is, of course, that most countries really struggle to create the sort of dynamic business environment, the dynamic <coughs> set, uh, set of customers and citizens that, that drive a sort of Schumpeterian uh, creative destruction process very effectively. That's certainly the case for the UK. And in my paper, if you have a look at it, you'll see a number of statistics around some of the really rather worrying um, aspects of the UK business population. And even though you know, we've heard that it's not just about the businesses, they are, of course, a key part of innovation in the economy. Now, I won't go into all of those statistics. I'll just mention two, and you can read the rest, because it makes a little bit of bleak reading. Um, but if you look at the Community Innovation Survey, and you take out people who say they're innovative and innovation active because they are involved in buying or developing software and computer hardware, then only 15% of businesses in this country say that they're innovative, that they have any innovation activity going on. And only 15% of firms provide any kind of training for innovation. Um, and the outcome, and I know it's incredibly um, difficult to measure, is that if this works, if you look at this chart, which shows the percent of turnover coming from innovative products or um, new to market or new to firm innovative uh, products, 
In the UK, it's only 7%. Now, I don't know if 7% is good or bad. It would be interesting in people's views. But compared to the EU average of 14, it certainly doesn't look stellar. Um, and while there are, of course, many things the UK is brilliant at, I would be left with some concerns with that kind of background. So, um, how, how could one try and address something like that? Well, my next point is that innovation is really complex. And if you look at my paper, the first chart there is this. I'm not putting it up to dazzle you or to want you to start debating it or indeed see any of the detail. The point is that it's a complex system and that there are feedback loops, which can be either positive or negative. And what we know from these kinds of systems is that you can get vicious and virtuous cycles going on and you can definitely get increasing returns. In other words, complementarities, which mean that things become more than the sum of their parts. And of course, the best known example of that is clustering, where you, you sort of get the right people and the right financing and the right science and the right technology and the right customers and the right supply chains and the right infrastructure in one place. And suddenly that place takes off in a way that's very difficult to replicate. Um, this is really important for the way we think about public policy, but it's not typically the way that we tend to think about it. Um, but I want to leave you with that idea of increasing returns because I think I'll come back to it and we might want to debate it later. Now, seeing that kind of chart, you might think, well, mm, you know, well, that's exactly the kind of thing the government is really bad at either managing or understanding or dealing with or interacting with. So governments should stay well away. But, you know, they can't. Um, governments are very big actors in their own right in this system. They fund a lot of the key inputs like skills, education, science, infrastructure. Um, they buy a lot of the outputs. In the UK, um, the government the, um, is around 40% of GDP. So you cannot ignore it, whatever you want. And personally, I'm actually a kind of small state, is good type person in my heart, but I'm not in favour of small state if that leads to ineffective outcomes and a waste of taxpayers' money. Um, and so sometimes small is not beautiful. And this next child is really just a conceptual illustration of what I mean. But if you've got increasing returns and you've got set a government programme of some sorts, say, then the blue line might be what your benefits from the programme look like as a function of scale. So, starting off, you're basically just putting some drops in the ocean and having no impact whatsoever. If you provide enough um, intervention, as it were, enough support and enough activity and this kind of directionality that uh, Mariana was talking about, you might hit a kind of increasing returns curve where you get critical mass of people, of talent, of finance, of science, of ideas, basically starting to, with the spillover effects that go with it, to really take off. And of course, there might then be some diminishing returns at the end. So the S-curve is what your benefits might look like. If your costs then look like the sort of simple assumption linear curve that I've got there with some fixed costs to start with, then you can see that the green line, which is the net benefits, so only benefits minus costs, um, doesn't really even break even until the size of the intervention is quite reasonable. It certainly isn't optimal until it's even larger. Now, this is a conceptual thing, and it does depend on an assumption of um, increasing returns. But even if, uh, in my heart of hearts, I don't necessarily think um, a big state is what we should aim for, if we need to be bigger in order to actually get returns for taxpayers' money, then that's what we have to do. Now, my final point was about how do we make the underlying frameworks more effective for this kind of thinking to be uh, even possible. Um, and I'll kind of, it's, again, there's a lot of stuff in the paper about how I think governments can be much more strategic, more material, more coherent, and more dynamic. But underlying all of that, we just need to update the framework we're using around market failures and cost-benefit analysis to take into account the reality, the empirical reality, of how agents work, how individuals and how businesses actually make decisions. And Andy mentioned yesterday a number of these behavioural biases or cognitive biases. They're all real. And if we assume people are perfectly rational, then we're going to get the wrong kind of answers in our public policy. Now, the reason why I think this particularly matters is because, of course, policymakers are equally prone to these biases. And the one that I, partic I wanted to just briefly mention is anchoring. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the 
Ariely study, which, where people are asked to write down their last two digits of the social <coughs> security number, which is basically a kind of random selection of two numbers for each individual. And then they're asked to bid on items such as chocolate or wine or computer equipment. The people whose two last digits of social security number are higher tend to bid 60 to 120 percent more for the same items because they're in their brains, they have been anchored to think about those numbers. Now, that kind of anchoring goes on in government as well. And where we start off by saying the government should do nothing unless we prove there's a market failure, what happens is we're on the sort of uh, left-hand side of this chart. We end up doing a little bit around the edges and probably end up in that negative cost-benefit place on my previous chart. Whereas if we started by saying we should do everything and then just stop doing the things that clearly are not for the government to do, then we might probably do some things that are slightly too many. <coughs> the optimum is somewhere in the mid middle, and if we, if we just look at it from one end of the telescope, I think we're just going to get the wrong answer. We should look at it from both ends of the telescope. And finally, as Mariana says, have really good evalu evaluation so we have good um, evidence. So the three questions that that sort of sets up in my mind, and I'm hoping that the panel and the rest of the day will start to address are, uh, first of all, um, how can we collate the best possible evidence about these issues? Because that's the only way we're going to convince policymakers to change their mindsets. Um, secondly, how do we guard again against government failure? It is a legitimate concern for people who talk about governments doing more, and we need to be able to respond to that. And hopefully our practitioners have many experiences of how to do that. And then finally, just a broader question about is this it, or are we missing something? Is there something even beyond the kind of systems that we're talking about that we need to be really bringing into the heart of innovation policy? So, with that, I thank you for your patience um, for my introductory remarks. I would like to hand over next to Ian Gray. Ian is the Chief Executive of the Technology Strategy Board here in the UK. Um, the TSB is essentially the main innovation agency in the UK. Um, Ian is a chartered engineer, a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineers, a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and in 2007 he was awarded the Royal Aeronautical Society Gold Medal. He was also elected the fellow of the Royal Society in Edinburgh in 2011, and he was recently um, given a CBE in the New Year's Honours. So we couldn't have a better person from the UK to, to shed light on some of these issues. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Ian. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tara. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, say a, a few words. Thanks for the introduction. You did miss one very important uh, thing off. I'm also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, so I was uh, <laughs> intrigued to hear Matthew's introduction, and I actually reinforce uh, something Mariana said about um, RSA animates. Um, the communication tool that the RSA has developed, RSA Animates, has taken some of these complex messages that traditionally get viewers on YouTube of a couple of hundred into the realms of a, a, a sort of cartoon YouTube that's getting viewers of the order of hundreds of thousands. So it really has moved the sort of communication of complex messages into a, a much broader population. I've got 10 minutes, and what I'd like to uh, really share with you um, this morning is a little bit about my practical experience in the uh, Technology Strategy Board. I would emphasize that I am a practitioner. I'm not a theorist. Um, I spent 28 years in the uh, aerospace um, industry. And in fact, not untypically of the Technology Strategy Board, many of the employees, in fact, most of the employees have been recruited from, from industry itself. Um, Tara gave a, a, a brief introduction to the Technology Strategy Board, but just to sort of reinforce who we are, what we are. We are UK's innovation agency. We are a, a public body. We were set up in 2007. We were set up with the objective of, so to read the, uh, the charter, to accelerate economic growth by stimulating business-led innovation. We're now 2014, seven years on, that sort of aim is still very much at the heart of what we do, but how we do it is very different to how we did it back in 2007. We do it through a mixture of um, funding, a mixture of funding, infrastructure support, 
and connecting the, uh, the innovation landscape. From a funding perspective, since 2007, we've um, enabled investment in innovation projects to the tune of about £3 billion public-private sector partnership. Our funding model is based on both a targeted um, approach, picking, to use Mariana's uh, maternal um, um, uh, cue, not picking winners necessarily from my perspective, but actually picking the races, picking the, the key strategic target areas that we believe the UK can best benefit from. But we also have funding mechanisms that are what we would call responsive mode mechanisms, um, open all times just for companies to approach us with new, new ideas, things like the Smart Awards Fund, which Vince Cable talked about last night. Infrastructure support, we have developed um, a number of ways in which we support business. The, probably the most prominent, and the one that, again, Vince Cable talked about most last night, was the development of the, the so-called the new catapult centres, the technology and innovation centres. And we've established seven catapult centres in the last couple of years. They are facilities that are open access to business, um, to develop and, and move their ideas closer to market, providing access to world-class equipment, world-class um, facilities that otherwise they could not gain, gain access to. But the thing I really wanted to talk about today was, was not necessarily um, those uh, particular um, funding programs or, or the catapult centres itself, but talk about our approach to what I see um, described as the challenge-led agenda. When we were established back in 2007, um, from a governmental point of view, we inherited a number of different tools, and I would characterize them as all technology push kind of tools. And if I was to sort of look back on the last seven years, I wouldn't say catapults were the biggest success. I wouldn't say the SME support is necessarily our big, biggest success. I think the biggest success in the last seven years has been actually converting what was a technology push agenda into a challenge-led pool agenda. We recognize the major challenges that society faces, global warming, aging population, uncertainty about future energy supplies, and we recognise the role that innovation plays in tackling those uh, challenges. And we sort of realised quite early on that if the response can be properly mobilised, and government has a key role to play in this, then these major challenges can actually be a powerful spur for innovation and actually really stimulate economic growth. Technology push is right in its own right in terms of developing the science and the pure technologies but it's the challenge-led approach that pull, pull the, pulls those things through and creates real economic uh, growth. We've also been working very closely with the European Commission and, and uh, our European colleagues, and really pleased that the new European funding programme, Horizon 2020, also focuses much, much more explicitly on using the societal challenges as a, as a driver for innovation. We know that to solve these big global challenges, we cannot just leave it to the, uh, to the market itself. Why? The problem space that we've looked at is significantly more than just being about funding. There's many reasons for it, and I think one of the key reasons is to solve these challenges and create economic growth is a concerted action that involves many players at once, and it won't just happen naturally. Many of the people involved in the science and technology development don't necessarily see the longer-term trends. Businesses and researchers can't always see the nature of the opportunities that are emerging. They don't necessarily have visibility of the policies that are being developed or needed to tackle the challenges. We recognise that business investment is often too low and late, too late and constrained by the kind of things we heard about last night, technical and, and financial risks, and, and the lack of access to capital. With any of these major challenges, disruptive solutions will only come about, we think, by taking greater levels of, of, of risk. Failure as a positive metric, I think, is a really important theme for uh, discussions over the next two days. We also see that new solutions are going to require whole new supply chains. Just to pick one very simple example, 
low carbon vehicles, electric vehicles, for example, will require fundamentally quite different um, supply chains in terms of powertrain than the old um, um, combustion engine supply chain market. So new supply chains need new partnership models, new investment, and new innovation investments at multiple points along the supply chain. Innovative solutions in these sort of global challenges does require very, very strong collaboration between researchers, policymakers, and businesses. Somebody has to convene these um, different bodies, and I think that is a role the Technology Strategy Board has played. It's a role much, much more significant than just the pure funding role. One of the ways in which we have done this is to develop a model of what we've described as innovation platforms. An innovation platform for us is an approach which brings together the public and the private sectors to work on a societal challenge where government creates the global business opportunity and it creates the right framework and right context to help UK businesses to address the opportunity. We currently have five innovation platforms that we are progressing. One is on low carbon vehicles, and I know Tony Harper is here from Jaguar Land Rover, and I'm sure he will give you later this morning some real practical feedback on the low carbon vehicle innovation platform. The other is assisted living, low impact buildings, sustainable agriculture and food, and stratified medicine. Low impact buildings was a question that came up last night. The construction industry is a notoriously difficult industry to actually uh, stimulate innovation. It's full of small companies, um, one-man uh, players. But actually, we have driven the low-impact building agenda, the innovation agenda around low-impact buildings through regulation. And regulation in a staged sense, the low-impact building agenda, Code 4 Sustainable Homes by 2016, has been a key driver for innovation. And, and the innovation platform is a great example of where we've not just provided funding, but we've used government and policy to help stimulate that innovation through providing the right regulatory frameworks. There are many other areas where the Technology Strategy Board has used what we would describe as a challenge-led approach. We heard last night about the, uh, the US SBIR scheme. In the UK, we've launched the SBRI scheme. We've had um, about £190 million worth of projects working across uh, double figures, public sector organisations and, and government departments. Everything from funding new ways of combating online identity fraud through to uh, the management of, of, of wounds and sores um, remotely at, at the home through digital uh, technologies. SBRI is a real good example of a challenge-led approach. As I say, I'll follow um, Mariana's maternal uh, direction of not talking about picking winners, but I do believe very strongly in one of the roles that we have played as the Technology Strategy Board is picking the races, picking the themes that we are engaged in. We haven't necessarily picked the individual businesses that we support. We do that through a comp competition process, but we have identified the key strategic themes. And those strategic themes have both fed into and feed off the things that Vince talked about last night, the industrial strategy, with specific actions targeted at individual sectors. It uses, informs, and uses the framework of the eight great technologies, the science uh, um, and research framework that the, the science minister put in place. These frameworks help convene public, private sector working together and help align priorities. A recent development, again in terms of picking, using the word picking as opposed to picking winners, um, was the um, introduction of the Longitude Prize. I don't know um, outside of the UK how well this travelled. But this was a, an initiative um, building on a, a, a prize that um, is recognize, was recognised some 300 years ago, but reintroducing it, relaunching a, a prize and engaging the public in actually selecting what they believe is the key priority theme to move forward with. It was an, an initiative launched in May together with Nesta and the BBC, 
and we shortlisted six priority themes and put it to the public to actually identify what they saw as the key societal challenge and the key priority theme that they would like to see an investment on. And we put forward, with Nesta, a £10 million prize for the Longitude Prize. The public selected antimicrobial resistance, the, uh, the problem of drug-resistant bacteria as what they saw as the biggest societal challenge moving forward. £10 million is not a huge sum of money in terms of the investment the drug companies put in place, but as a stimulus for innovation, it shows how small amounts of money presented in the right sort of challenge way can really engage public, private sector and business together in terms of um, identifying solutions to those challenges. And the last thing I just wanted to briefly talk about, which I feel often gets missed in the, uh, the political debate around funding, is the value of demonstrators. In our own innovation platforms work, we found it really, really valuable. It's expensive, but to actually put in place real-life demonstrators that bring public, private sector and business together. A great example was the Low Carbon Vehicles Demonstrator Program, which we launched in 2010. At its time, it was the largest trial in Europe. It was putting some 340 electric vehicles from a wide range of manufacturers on the road in real-life conditions. And I believe the feedback from that has been a real stimulus in terms of the technology developments um, in, the, in the manufacturers and the supply chain and has really helped build the confidence from a market perspective about the role of hybrid electric uh, vehicles. In terms of uh, benefits, failure as a positive metric is something I think we should pay attention to. It's not something that necessarily our funders, the Treasury, uh, listen to. The kind of arguments that they really want to understand are what the economic benefits of our programmes have been. And we've commissioned independent researchers to estimate the impact of our activities. We see that for every pound that we've invested, we see a, an increase of up to nine pounds in the value of the UK economy. Now that's a very skewed return. That's not a consistent nine to one return across all of the uh, companies that we've supported. In fact, I would say it's probably about 20% of the companies where we see real positive benefit. So that rule of actually how you aggregate success across a broader innovation agenda, rather than sort of micromanaging, recognizing failure as a positive metric is, is good. We need to find the right sort of mechanism of presenting that in a, in a consistent way back to, from a treasury point of view in terms of GVA, jobs, and return to the uh, economy if we're going to if we're going to uh, receive the benefits of the kind of statements that Vince Cable made last night in terms of doubling our budget. So anyway, I hope that gives you some sort of feel from a practical point of view of the kind of initiatives we have in the uh, Technology Strategy Board. My key message would be it's more than just about funding. Societal challenge can be a real driver of, of, of innovation. I think the innovation platform model we've put in place works and is scalable and I think is a real key moving forward. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce um, um, our next speaker, Mariano Laplane. He is the president of the Centre for Strategic Studies and Management, a social organisation affiliated uh, to the Brazilian Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. He's also uh, associate professor at the Institute of Economics of the State University of Campinas, where he heads the graduate study program. And um, he's a member of the Mercosur Economic Research Network based in Montevideo in Uruguay. So we are very lucky to have him here to give us his perspectives on innovation and um, how to make it even more successful and the, the role of um, the state in all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before I start, let me thank the organizers, Mariana, for inviting me and Tara for introducing me to this session. Uh, since, since the crisis of the developmental state in the late 80s, Brazil has been involved in an intense debate over the role of the state and the private sector in development, in promoting growth and reducing inequality. And one key aspect 
of this debate has been the potential contribution and distortions that could emerge from industrial policies and innovation policies. So I must say I was very happy when I was invited to the conference to see that these concerns of us in Brazil are shared by so many other people. I was particularly happy to see that others share with us the view that industrial and innovation policies have to do with creating new markets instead of correct, correcting market failures. That's, this uh, should be almost self-evident in developing countries, but unfortunately it isn't, at least not for those who believe markets emerge naturally wherever you have the right conditions, like uh, entrepreneurship, potential customers, and the right institutions like property rights and enforceable contracts. As someone said before, I think it was Mariana, uh, markets are far from emerging, emerging naturally. Markets result from intense social interaction between individuals, organizations, and institutions. So the process of market creation involves organizational learning and institutional building. That's why it takes time. And short-termism, when you're dealing with creating markets, is not something, is not a good approach. When when dealing with uh, disruptive innovation, implying uncertain results, sizable investment, and huge potential rewards, the process of market creation is even more complex. Brazil has had, along the path of its development history, some experience with market creation involving technological innovation that change significantly its economic structure. Uh, let me mention just two examples from the 70s, old times. Uh, the first would be the development of science-based tropical agriculture, which allowed Brazil to expand food production and to become a large food exporter in a few decades. The second example could be the technological development for deep sea oil extraction that contributed to Brazil becoming, a decade later, self-sufficient in energy. In both cases, in both successful cases, public involvement through, at the time, state-owned enterprises was crucial, given the uncertainty and the huge costs involved. Private organizations, both firms and research institutions, both from Brazil and abroad, were crowded in by the high risk and costly public initiatives. Now, these two successful experiences were very important for the creation of CGE, the organization I work for, in 2001. CGE means Center for Management and Strategic Studies. It's a private, non-profit organization. We're not a government agency, in spite that we work for the government. In fact, most senior people at CGE were, at some point of their professional life, involved with those two successful experiences I'd mentioned before. The core of our activities consists of foresight studies, strategic, strategic assessment, and information and knowledge management. Based on CGE's experience, allow me to elaborate on the questions posed by Mariana for this session. Uh, I will focus, I shall focus on the aspects related to knowledge management and not on the equally and probably even more important financial dimension of mission-oriented programs because I believe the later would be better addressed by other people, maybe in other sessions. So the first question posed for this session was, what are the challenges for public, or in our case, private organizations dealing with mission-oriented innovation programs? Now, to put it in a very simple, straightforward uh, way, I would uh, think of three different challenges, or maybe one challenge which consists in trying to bridge three different gaps which are very important to the successful to the success for the success of any 
mission-oriented program. The first gap is what I call, I would call, the knowledge gap. Being able to anticipate future societal and technological challenges that can result in new technological and market opportunities is not simple. The challenge, in fact, goes well beyond identifying broadly defined potential threats or uh, identifying knowledge areas potentially fruitful. In other words, it's not enough to target energy supply as a future challenge. You need to go beyond that. You need to target the potential solution. Could it be renewable energy? Of course. But then again, that's far from sufficient. What type of renewable energy? Is it solar? Is it biomass? And once you define, you specify the target as biomass, then you have to ask, what are we betting on? Are we betting on new equipment, new chemical processes, new inputs? So the more you move forward in detailing your target, uh, the more complex accessing the knowledge you need becomes. In other words, searching for disrupting innovation involves at some point a much more detailed definition of the target. Specification of the problem, the strategy you, you're gonna follow, and the amount of resources needed requires previous knowledge that is not always immediately avail available to public or private organizations. The second gap I would call the coordination gap. Designing and running large-scale mission-oriented innovation programs demands a great deal of information gathering, processing, and sharing among government agencies, business, and scientists. Coordinating the actions of organizations with heterogeneous interests and mind frames demands special skills and previous experience that are not always available. Public, some public agencies usually have some experience facing that, that type of challenges in large defense-related programs, but not necessarily in other areas. No. Let me give you just one example of the difficulties you, you can face trying to bridge this coordination gap. Efficient coordination involves, among other things, balancing property rights over previously accumulated and newly created knowledge, as well as the corresponding rewards among public and private agents. You'll probably need a huge amount of lawyers to get this coordination uh, through contracts of property rights in place. But there's still a third challenge, which I think it's the technology management gap. Efficient assessment and monitoring of, of mission-oriented innovation programs require the ability to use technology management tools, like the ones needed to assess the degree of maturity of available technologies, or the tools you need to, to, to use to identify which technologies are critical for the success of, <clears throat> of a given program. Private firms running long-run running long and complex innovation projects, as well as some agency, public agencies in charge of defense or space programs, usually have experience in using technology management tools. But this is not necessarily the case in every public agency. What I'm trying to point out, mentioning these three gaps, is not at all that mission-oriented programs are unfeasible or unreasonable. All I'm saying is that we have to be humble and take into account the complexities involved in innovating nowadays, which is something that the uh, president of the Brazilian Development Bank mentioned yesterday evening. So complexity actually involves other dimensions beyond bridging these three gaps. And Luciano yesterday mentioned as one of the 
factors that contributes to complexity, that all this has to be done in a democratic setting. So you have to legitimize your decision-taking process and the, and the outcomes of this process. In the past, in those two successful examples I mentioned before, food production and energy, oil extraction from deep sea, uh, the key for the success in bridging the gaps of knowledge, coordination, and technology management uh, was that the two public agencies involved, Embrapa and Petrobras, had the resources, had the resources, and had the legitimacy, legitimacy to go through the whole process. The context today is very different. At that time, Brazil had uh, a developmental state run by a very authoritarian government. It's different today. We must face these same challenges, dialoguing and getting a response, getting the agreement from society. Uh, and all this has to be done in a rapid way. We need agencies able to give rapid response to all these future challenges. Once again, I'm just pointing out to the complexity and the need to be humble. I'm not saying at all that we should not try to do it. Quite to the contrary. I won't talk about uh, crowding out and pick the winners attending to Mariana's request, and because I'm also running uh, uh, low on time. Huh? So let me, let me jump to the third question posed by, by Mariana. Huh? Why, why, what criteria should be used for evaluating public investment in mission-oriented programs? Um, I think the most uh, interesting thing about evaluation is what are the criteria you use, you should use ex ante. Because evaluating the results afterwards is not at, as difficult. The difficult lies in ex ante beforehand making the right choices. And what I have to say about this is just common sense. Most of the time, we, we work at CGE, and I believe in other public agencies, with three types of criteria. We look to the payoff, potential payoff, then we, we, we look to the feasibility, and third, we, we, we try to look into the complementary measures required for the creation of the new market effectively happen. So, uh, not very difficult to, to, to understand. Uh, the first thing we look, the first criterion, has to do with uh, answering the question, is it worthwhile? Is it worthwhile? The second one is, is it possible? And the third question is, what if? What if we successfully solve the problem? So the first criterion involves an assessment of costs and benefits, how much will we will spend and how much can we get in, in reward if the technical, the technological challenge is uh, solved successfully. The second one takes risk into account and crucially, the feasibility has to do with assessing, uh, being able to assess the degrees of maturity and criticality of the technologies involved. The third one involves the what if question involves the assessment of the type of institutional arrangements needed for the innovation resulting effectively in the creation of a new market. New technologies do not automatically result in new markets. New markets, as I said before, are the result of complex institutional building. This cr criterion requires assessing issues such as, for instance, what changes need to be introduced in regulation what are the additional public and or private organizations that need to be involved in order to make effective use of the new technology? So let me finish by addressing the fourth and last question raised by Mariana, um, which is what is the role of our, my organization in this type of programs? Um, 
as I said before, we're a private and non-profit organization. We, uh, we do more counseling than decision making. And um, what we do, in fact, to try to bridge these gaps is first bring people together and um, make them uh, dialogue. We bring scientists, business associations, business and government agencies together and um, try to get the right answers to the questions. Do we successfully do this? Not always, but there's some network building going on most of the time. We, we're small agencies, so we rely a lot of contracting, outsourcing, and um, most of the time, what we do is useful for the government. Not always, but in some um, of the programs, what, what we, we um, produce was, was um, useful in, in designing policy or assessing policy. Um, is what we do enough? Certainly not. I'm, I'm, as I said, um, we're dealing most with knowledge management, building tools for technology management and counseling. Um, probably the most uh, challenging dimension of the whole problem is addressed by the National, by the Brazilian Development Bank, which is putting together the right finance to make all the things happen. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariano, for that really informative and extremely interesting um, talk, which I think starts to get us into the granularity of what some of the issues and challenges are in driving mission-oriented and challenge-led innovation, but also not saying that it's impossible. It just means that we need to be really thoughtful and pragmatic about it. Um, and who better to invite to speak next than Cheryl Martin? Um, who's the current acting director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency in, in Energy, in other words, ARPA-E, at the United States Department of Energy. And she's responsible additionally for the technology to market program there. Um, prior to joining ARPA-E, she was executive in residence at the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins and spent 20 years at Roman Haas, the chemicals company, starting as their senior scientist. And I uh, very much look forward to hearing from Cheryl what works for ARPA-E. Thank you. I actually will be, um, I think I'll be very short because um, I think what I wanted to do is just simply explain um, ARPA-E's mission um, and our structure that follows from that, what we look at for metrics and what I think are the couple of challenges that might tee up a conversation. Um, ARPA-E is a five-year-old government agency with a very broad mission. Uh, the development and deployment of transformational energy technologies with the mandate to either reduce imports, reduce emissions, or improve efficiency. So you could drive a truck through the mission. So what really matters is how do you choose to do that mission? And so as Arun came in five years ago, um, and I've continued, um, we've looked at creating something that does both of these things. And if you look at um, the top piece of this arc, it really is setting out technology programs. And at RPE, um, I think the way we think about our mandate, the only thing we know about energy is that it will be different than we think today, right? Five years ago, gas, nuclear, the dynamics of coal, the, the geopolitics were very, very different. So why should we assume five years in the future that we, that we know what it'll be like? So we view our agency as creating options. So we are the optionality agency. And so we work across the entire spectrum of energy from carbon capture to, um, to fuel cells, from genetic modification of plant to be more fuel-like to natural gas vehicles. Many of the things we work on, if they were successful, would eliminate the other things. But we don't know the path of innovation. We only know that it, it is discontinuous and not predictable. Um, however, we do know that for, to be effective, you have to do more than just set out objectives and select projects and get um, you know, those projects in place. Because ideas to market is a very low yield process. And so why do things usually fail? They fail because you don't have the right team, and I mean team in the macro of getting it from the idea to the market. You have the wrong definition of value, because we never get, as researchers, to define value ourselves. It would be so nice. Um, and you actually, and then it's about ex poor execution if you fail. And so at RPE, when we engage on a project for three years, um, we start with the, if it works, will it matter? 
And then we start from the very beginning with a conversation about exactly what's going to happen during the life of this project. So we are kind of in your pocket the whole time. Our program directors are there for three years. So I'd say 80% of our agency is either a three-year term federal employee or a contractor. So nobody's there to live for this agency. They're there to live for the programs that they're putting in place and to drive them to outcome. And I think that changes the dynamic. But at the same time, we work with our teams to say, what happens at month 37? And about half our awards go to academics, a third go to small business, and only 20% go to industry. And so for many of these people, the whole idea of this impacting the market is a very foreign thing and, uh, and very uncomfortable. We have very intelligent people being made uncomfortable is not a very productive thing usually, right? So I, I tell them, and it works better in America than here, but um, you, know, you need to know, not, not, you don't have to become a business person. You don't even have to agree to be the entrepreneur. You have to speak enough French to cross Paris, right? So it's, uh, it's a very small amount of uh, knowledge here. But that's our tech to market program, which is the bottom piece which is all about during the life of this project, if you're really going to have something to hand off to a research partner, to a Department of Defense test bed, to a commercial partner, at month 37, I don't tell you what you have to do, but we look at where the program will be and we say, what must happen? And then we walk back to today. And so we walk back and we say, OK, but you might need to know about those markets. You might need to know about the supply chain. How do those people play together? Do small businesses exist? Is it a not invented here? Is it all incumbents? If you're going to talk to Volvo supply chain and also BMW, well, you should know that those two things often never connect. Um, and so we help educate about that. What techno-economics should you do and when? You make decisions in research projects that greatly affect the cost metrics, and certainly in energy, that's important. So shouldn't thinking about where those need to fit matter as you make those choices over that period of time? And as the skills and resources, how do you tell your story? How do you understand warrants and licensing? How do you understand dealing going from contracts to um, uh, grants to contracts? Um, how do you actually work in a partnership? What about your own skill base? Often the founder, the, entrepreneur, um, the, uh, the inventor is not the entrepreneur. Um, how do you think about that? How do you think about team? And I think the most important thing is stakeholder engagement. Over the, the time of a project, we actually map from the beginning who has to be interested in this space, the regulators, the people you sell to, those who define value, the end customers. What do they want to know? When do they want to know it? And how long might it take them to engage? Um, do they need to be involved at day one or do they need to be involved at, at year five? And uh, again, we're looking at being accelerative, and you can only be accelerative if you know who needs to come to the party. And so um, at RPE, we, a lot of the things we pick when we first pick the areas, people say that is impossible. And so we need people to be involved from the beginning because we walk them from the impossible to the plausible to the inevitable. And it is a journey, and relationships take time. I don't think any of us have ever written a paper with or signed a contract or heck, gone on a second date with anyone we just met yesterday, generally. Um, and so I think all of these things need to be you know, taken into this fabric of how do you bring together this ecosystem. And so this is our model that we've used um, when we focus a lot on outcomes. The bottom one is about good use of taxpayer dollars. The middle one is about technology and how we see it and how we might measure it, patents and publications. But all that really matters for success is that there's how does it get towards the market? Do we have projects going on in partnership with government agencies? Because that's appropriate for them. Do we have them startups? We have 24 startups in our five years. Do we have follow-on funding from, from venture and other private firms? Uh, $91 million we put into 22 companies has been followed on over $625 million already. And so we're seeing the threads as we weave this tapestry of innovation and success. But you need them all, because especially in energy, no one of them defines your success. The paths to market are many, and uh, we need to continue to look at how does that um, there is no one answer. And so how do we have a dialogue with our regulators? We're very well supported, both sides of, of government in the US, which is rare, um, because we're pretty willing to talk about all of these things and the realities of both the things that don't work as well as the signs of what do. And so happy to continue the dialogue, and that's all I have. Thank you.
thank you, Cheryl, very much um, for sharing with us how RFIE takes a very active approach. And I think that the speakers have demonstrated there are some common themes around how you can make this kind of innovation activity really, really successful. There's some themes around it's not just about the funding. There's some themes around it's very much about public engagement and professional execution. But what I'd like to do now is hand over to Dan um, for a response. Um, Dan, we are running a little bit behind time, so if we can try and keep it to maybe about 10 minutes, that would be great, and then that will still leave us a bit of time for discussion with the audience um, at the end before we break for coffee. Um, Dan is the Monk Chair of Innovation Studies and Professor of Global Affairs and Political Science, Director of Academic Research, and Co-Director of the Innovation Policy Lab at the University of Toronto. He's an expert on rapid innovation-based industries and their globalization and has been advisor to a very large number of our organizations such as the World Bank, World Economic Forum, TECAS, IFC, the UN, and the Asian Development Bank. So a fantastic person to now respond to our practitioners in terms of some of the themes that are coming out. Dan, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take just a few minutes. Uh, do you hear me? When? No, okay. um, and what I want to do, um, as I was listening to the speakers, is um, we have a group here of people who actually run agencies that are supposed to create innovation-based growth and change. So to muse about what does it really mean and try to make it slightly more coherent than just stories. So first of all, I think that the one thing that we have to understand is that the logic, the strategic logic of agencies that aim to create innovation based growth is very different than just economic development. Because what happens when you try to create innovation, in effect, each and every one of those agencies is trying to create actors that will do things that we don't know what they are right now, and then stimulate them, it's not enough to just create them, stimulate them to work which is extremely different than stating, oh, I want to have an economic development, uh, let's look at the car industry, we know what cars are, we know what companies are, we know what they need, let's build the factories, have a few programs to create the skilled labor, and give them soil. What you're trying to do is to create actors which you don't know what they're going to do. And that's a completely different strategic game. It also means that you have to constantly experiment which usually it's not something bureaucracy is very good at. As a matter of fact, we create bureaucracy in order to run the rules, not in order to experiment and constantly change the rules. Um, and you also need to constantly co-evolve. Uh, when you have no industry, you're trying to create a new industry, you should do certain things. When you have an industry which is already quite successful and you have a few companies, you should have different policies. And you should also be able to kill policies. Yes, I just spent $250 million. It didn't work very well. Maybe we should change it. Um, but what I do think that happened in this panel is a little bit of confusion about how innovation-based structural change happened. And there's basically two models, if we think about it in our mind. One is sort of a Silicon Valley-like. You create a lot of small companies. They create products. Those products particulate, and they change or create new industries. The other, and I think energy is the example to date, is you have a whole system that works, and in need works. In order for us to even have this discussion right now, the energy system of United Kingdom the kingdom and the whole world need to work, right? We have electricity, we have lights, we have all the rest. In order to change that system, it's not enough to just innovate on the size. Because you have to create those complementaries. You have also to change regulations about how the whole system works. And therefore, the role of government needs to be different. It also is extremely different in terms of financing. It's quite okay if you want to have innovation in software, to spend a few millions here and there. It's not okay to spend a few million dollars if you want to really change deep water oil drilling. It's a different game. Uh, and what I think we should do 
is to realize that. And as we think about how to build agencies and how to devise policies, we have to understand that innovation comes in different flavors, in different stages of development, and different agencies with different financial structures, capabilities, and relationship to private industries and universities have to appear if we want to have different kinds of innovation. Um, last but not least, it also means if you want to experiment, if you want to co-evolve, there's a question of where you want to put that agency. If you really want to experiment, does it make sense to create, like we hear too often, a huge central new innovation agency and the prime minister of your country comes and said, this is the future, this is the deal, I'm putting $2 billion on the line and uh, this is going to define my prime ownership. What are the chances that anyone would experiment or take risk? On the other side, actually, if you put a small agency on the side, almost invisible, spend a few million dollars uh, every year, um, what are the chances that it will be able to experiment? And the problem, I think, is we don't even engage this debate. And what I would like to hear, preferably from the panelists, is a little bit of reflection about that. What is, and let's put politics back into place, what is your ability to experiment and especially kill programs that doesn't work? Um, and with that, and with the time, I'll just stop. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, very much for those extremely thoughtful um, points and this, these dilemmas we have about different types of innovation and differentiating between them. And also, how do we get agencies that are able to experiment in the context of the political economy and indeed the, the funding that they have been given? Um, I hope that you found that a rich discussion with lots and lots of material to get one's head around. Um, now is your opportunity to get involved, ask any questions or comment on what you have heard, maybe propose an alternative point of view. I'll take maybe two or three questions to start off with and then I'll turn to the panel members um, uh, uh, appropriately um, and then we'll try and finish 20 past. I'm looking at Mariana, I think that should be our aim so that um, there's plenty of time then for mingling of coffee and tea as well. So we'll start off with the two questions over here and then I'll, I'll go to the other sides of the room after those. So starting off over here, gentlemen um, yeah. in the front. Uh, thank you very much. That was a really fascinating panel, so thanks to and everyone. Uh, I was wanted to pick up a little bit on what you started with, with your opening slide and saying, is it a sense of greater scale uh, for some of these projects. And then I think in your paper you say that in the UK alone there's more than 800 growth initiatives and the TSB has 15. And so I suppose the question that I was interested for Ian and for others on the panel is, is there a sense of if you had unlimited resources, would you want to scale these things? Or are they already perfectly scaled? Or do you actually think, well, maybe some of these things are nice to have and you know, in a, if we had to cut resources, we would cut down to, say, seven or something like that? Something practical, I suppose. Hi, um, I'm Maya Forstatter from the UNEP inquiry into the uh, design of a sustainable financial system. Um, you all have kind of talked about how public agencies can drive innovation, support innovation through funding and sort of strategic procurement. Um, I, I wanted to make a link to uh, what Mariana and, and Andy Haldane in particular talked about last night in terms of short-termism in the financial system and ask you as practitioners um, sort of when you're helping these innovations to, to make that leap to scale, what do you need from the financial system? What, what do you see as the problems um, and what changes are needed there in addition to the work that you're doing within your own agencies. Excellent. Um, let me take, I think there was one more question over here. No, let, let, let's start with those two questions and I can see lots of people wanting to come in, but we'll 
hopefully keep our comments quite brief, but if I can start, Ian, uh, with you, if you could comment on this issue in practice of scaling of projects and what your experience is. And then perhaps I could ask Cheryl to react and respond to that question about, well, what do we need from financial markets? You work with, a lot with them um, in order for these missions to actually succeed. And then we'll go to questions on that side of the room and then that side of the room, and hopefully we'll have captured everybody. Um, I think the question of, of scale versus scope is, is probably one of the most fundamental questions we face on a on a day-to-day -day basis. If you look at um, the, the experiment, we were an experiment back in 2007. I think we now have models that, that do demonstrably work. And I, I would argue quite strongly that the, the real emphasis should be on scale. So scaling those things that work up rather than looking for new initiatives, new, new, t new tools, new toys, to, to, to use a new euphemism. The dilemma that we have is, um, from a, a, a political perspective, um, new um, increasing scope provides better announceables, bet better opportunities for uh, publicity. And, and so there is a, there is a sort of dilemma, dilemma there. And I think the long-term approach um, should be very definitely one of trying to find the, the, uh, the successes that we've got and scaling them up rather than constantly looking for new ways of doing things and new, new announceables. So should we be reducing the kind of things we're doing, which is kind of where you were coming, um, coming to in your question? Um, I, I think we've probably got about the right balance in terms of the, uh, the tools that we've got to help deliver innovation. I think if you look at the innovation platforms that I described, we've got five key, key themes. I think that's about right. Um, and, and I would argue very, very strongly the emphasis should be on scaling those up rather than increasing scope. Thanks, Ian, very much. I think Dan would like to also add a couple of comments. Oh, Just about right. scaling. Um, I think one question that has never been asked, and I think it's really important, is I completely agree that you need to scale. But should it be the agency that is responsible for innovation that should handle the scale up? Or might it be that if something works, you create a structure that then run it regularly, and you then let the agency, which has proven itself to be experimental and innovative, to move on to the next experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel um, I, I worked in two Institute of uh, Technologies in the US before I moved to Toronto, and I become very uncomfortable when people become too comfortable in what they do. <laughs> That's, I think some of those organizational questions, no doubt, are also at the heart of how do we make um, innovation agencies and the whole system really effective over the long term. Important thing of the dynamics there. Cheryl, what would you say to the question about the financial yeah, um, system? Absolutely. Um, I do agree. I think structure should follow your strategy. And I think if you start diluting your strategy, it gets very weird organizationally about what you do and what you're holding on to. But, um, but financial markets are something I worry about all the time, right? As we look at um, RPE's role in the early stage innovation, um, we do engage the private sector a lot. Um, the, the gap, um, as you look at the, the comeback, right? If you have market-led um, demand, you're going to incent public capital markets and you're going to come in, uh, you know, power purchase agreements, um, actual demand is going to come in and you're going to get growth capital into the space. Um, the gap between what we do and that type of market depends on the piece of energy. I agree that some of the markets exist, some don't, is what do you do in the pilot plant stage? There's a place where there is no value valuing capital that's going to step into that space, right? There's no pilot plant that I've ever seen in my life as a chemist that makes money when you're doing that. And so the whole question of it, that's out beyond RPE's skis, right? We can't, we are not really supposed to go there. Um, it's hard for a public market. It's hard for any lender to step back. And so we've started looking at um, where and how could um, defense, because they have a different interest in having small volumes. Because again, you want to do pilot plants in a way that the volume, you can't go from zero to millions of units in a day, right? Your supply chain needs to adjust. So are there places with um, first markets, overseas markets? In our case, we looked at um, flow cell batteries to telecom towers in Malaysia as a first market for some of our companies where they could get a little bit of cash flow to make a few projects to get themselves forward. Um, defense, again, they have unique 
pools of money looking at bases in the case of energy where they need, have certain needs. We've looked to family offices and other potentially more patient sources of capital. Um, we've been exploring with some of the loan program folks about are there ways to do um, grants that if they're successful could be subordinated debt. But I think there needs to be creativity in instruments to help bridge these spaces where I, I don't see that there's a logical way to step in. And I do think it gets to be a point, is it government, is it private? It's very gray, but very, very important. So if people have ideas, I would love to hear them. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Now, I know there are a lot of questions on this side of the room. I promised I'd start there, and then I'll, I'll co go over there. So um, can we have each of the four questions, or uh, one, two, three, and four, and um, can you be really brief and to the point so we have a chance for panel members to comment as well? For an issue like global warming, should our ideal be something like a Manhattan Project, something on that scale? Hello, my name is Caroline Norbury. I run a company called Creative England, which is about unlocking um, creative talent and helping creative businesses in particular to grow. Um, I've got a question in two parts. The first is to Dan. Um, you gave uh, an analysis or you, you, you set up two um, different models, uh, the Silicon Valley model and the big systemic model. I want to know whether or not, I want really a, more of an opinion from you in terms of which was, which, you know, which would be your preferred option and whether or not it's an either or an and both. And my second question is that in my very practical experience, innovation is very, very difficult to do in very large institutions. And actually, um, it works very, very well small scale and you need to be part of that ecosystem but working with a lot of large companies as I do once that once it goes in it usually dies so I'm quite interested in terms of how do you that may be just my experience but I'd like other people's views but um, but how do you make sure that innovation remains lies creative quick Hi, thank you, really insightful. Um, you all picked up on two facts. One was the need to kind of collect evidence very systematically to learn what works and what doesn't, and then at the same time to experiment and to increase experimentation in, in what you do. So how do you strike the balance between two different very polarizing cultures in my eyes, between the culture of evidence gathering, which is really rigorous, and at the same time the culture of experimentation, and what, do you, what, what is your experience of, of doing that in your public agencies? <clears throat> I was just struck between sort of the difference between two theories of the firm, you know, the more bureaucratic version and then the interesting ARPA E model, which is almost a self liquidating project based um, thing that deals with a lot of the bureaucratic um, problems of keeping innovation in silos and so on. I was wondering, we heard from Vince Cable that he, his way of dealing with that issue of not putting a political hand on the scale was, was to never intervene in the, in the innovation process. So he leaves it to the experts, um, and then that, that's supposed to ensure that it's not going to be skewed and it's going to be a real innovation process. But then we heard this morning that there's an implicit rule about, no, or an implicit understanding about um, political announceables. And I was just wondering what those are and whether we're in a context where there's a hard, hard constraint or an implicit, you know, is there a little bit of who will rid me of this turbulent uh, priest? where no one needs to, to say that we want political buzz because um, it's sort of an implicit understanding that's unwritten. And how do we get, real, get rid of that moral hazard issue? One more question over there, um, and then we'll come to the panel. <coughs> yes, I, I would like uh, Ian or someone from the UK also. Um, when it comes to device mission-oriented industrial and innovation policies in the European context. Uh, how do you manage this multi-level governance and the fact that you have 28 member states devising also their mission-oriented uh, visions and also regions now with the smart specialization concept and how this fits into a, a globalized world where the public authorities have to cooperate with big industrial players that act at uh, globalized levels, and then you give them R&D support, for example, but then production employment is created outside Europe or outside the country where you are uh, establishing your support policies. How a member state and Europe can tackle all these big, very big challenges? 
Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to innovate a little bit in terms of how we respond to that very rich set of questions in order to make sure that we've still got time to cover the rest of the room. And of course, the panel members will be available to discuss during the coffee break. But what I was going to ask very specifically was, Mariano, if you had a thought about applying your criteria, how you'd respond to the question about the Manhattan Project. Is that really the kind of scale of ambition that we need for um, global warming. Um, I was going to ask Dan to perhaps say a bit about the experimentation versus evaluation. And then, uh, Cheryl and Ian, I'm giving you a choice of answering whichever questions you felt you have the most to say about, but hopefully relatively briefly. And then if you still had unanswered questions, I'm sure you will, we will continue the discussion over the coffee break. Yes. Should I start? Yeah. Well, th thanks for the, the question. Um, we, I think there's a, there's a very um, evident contradiction here we have to deal with. There's a strong tension between um, words like the need to be open to experimentation and, and, and be able to kill programs and thinking of huge, expensive programs like the Manhattan one with, with, with a very specific target. No. The first uh, um, idea, like, resembles liquidity. Being able to, to experiment and being able to kill programs has to do with, it, it resembles the idea of liquidity in financial terms. While, while the other type of program, Manhattan, uh, resembles, it makes you think of a different kind of asset. You're investing a huge amount of money and maybe, maybe it wouldn't be so simple to stop at some point and say, no, I don't longer want to do this, or I won't be able to do it, even if I want to. It's more like fixed capital, no? unliquid asset at all. No? And there's no simple answer to this. You have to balance. Uh, I, I, I must confess I have some trouble imagining a, a, a Manhattan program project as a approach to uh, global warming or climate change. It's so. Uh, complex, so uh, um, full of uh, different types of challenges in the field of new materials, energy solutions, uh, uh, urban uh, 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 way to, to the, the way we organize our cities. So I, I have some difficulty imagining a single target in which we could invest huge amounts of money. So. Uh, there's no easy answer for this tension. We have to live with this. And in some cases, we'll, we'll be very liquid. And in others, we'll have to spend huge amounts of money and have the, a different type of finance for long run, very ambitious programs. Thank you. Dan. So um, I'll also try to then go back to finance, right? Because we're in mission oriented finance. So um, it's not either or. And the real problem, as I think Cheryl just mentioned, happens when you move in between. So I'll give an example, make it concrete. A few years ago, uh, Peter Cowley and I, Peter Cowley from the University of San Diego and I, organized a group to think about pro innovation for production in the US. And we had Erica Bill was there, Bill Azonek, and we had Erica Fuchs from Carnegie Mellon looking at optoelectronics. And what we found out is that in America, there were the leading startups, some of them getting governmental help, in optoelectronics trying to put a system on one chip, which is very difficult, and nobody has yet to produce, create the facility to produce. And they had the choice to go discrete, sort of all technology, and move production to China, or to go to the new technologies and be able to, so it's a win-win for the US, from point of view of government if they go, and it's a lose-lose if they go the other way. We found that only the one company that stayed private was able to move to production. And this is a systemic problem. Because if, assuming, as economists do, that somebody would have put the money to have a production facility that all startups could use, then all of those startups would have continued to innovate in the more advanced. But since VCs are unwilling to put hundreds of million dollars of facilities, public, uh, I will not even talk about public uh, markets, and nobody else was willing to do that. And government policies were unable to do that at the time. Um, we faced 
a serious problem of having the innovation coming from small companies, but having a systemic change in the US. Thank you. Um, um, let's go with Cheryl first, and then Ian for any quick comments on the other questions. Yeah, I think the question about um, how do you do you know, ex experiments and experience balancing, um, it's a really important question. I think that the whole idea of uh, being rigorous in what you expect from people and setting objectives about what we're going to use up front to measure how we're going drives the experiential piece and the rigor of this. But then, then the ability to consistently challenge yourselves and say, is anything from our process about how we write a grant to the area that we work in working? Is it relevant? Um, when you have, in our case, having, I mean, we have no assets except the people that we work with. And that people group is constantly moving. And that makes us much less likely to stay on a path that's not productive. Because, you know, I will leave in, in soon, relatively soon, and somebody else will come in and say, why was she doing that? And they'll change it. Mm -hmm. And that's good. That That's really good. And so I think that the structure of the agency can allow you to do um, challenging. And it's part of the culture. Right, even agency that's five years old. I just had a retreat with my team. We put up on the wall, what would be the rule that you would kill? Because it doesn't take long for the creeping threads of bureaucracy to wrap around you, right? The good story of the five monkeys in the cage and everybody's grabbing the bananas and the rest get wet. And after five or six of switch out of monkeys, nobody knows why they were not grabbing the bananas anymore, right? Because you forgot the reason and the, the, the the thing that caused you um, to have the reaction in the first place. It should be done away with. And so I think how do you challenge yourself as an organization to remember mm. that that happens? Wonderful, excellent. And Ian, any Okay, three comments? quick responses to the other questions. Caroline's question about large versus small, I think we tend to stereotype um, businesses as some amazing innovation happens in skunk works and large companies as some as, as examples of small companies that are very uninnovative and so I think we stereo do stereotype things what is true is um, the large corporates that are really good at innovation do tend to create skunk work type uh, type environments. I think it's also important to recognise that different sectors operate quite different at different clock speeds and Creative England and your interactions on the digital um, side of things are very different from the experiences of small and large companies in say biosciences and, 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 and in aerospace and automotive. Question around the um, member states, I mean, happy to talk about it over coffee. Uh, engagement with Horizon 2020 and many of the large corporates and, and businesses in, in the UK are very actively involved in, in European programmes. And so, uh, you know, I, I think there is good, really good engagement there. And just to clarify the, the um, political announceables co um, comment, I mean, to be very clear, what we've said is we are an arm's length body and, and, and we make our own decisions in terms of priorities. What I was describing was in response to a question of scope versus scale and, and, and the day-to-day -day tension that, that exists regarding um, political uh, announceables. But to be absolutely unambiguous, then it is uh, the Technology Strategy Board um, as an arm's length body that determines our prior priorities. Thank you very much, Ian. Now, Mariana is telling me that we absolutely must stop here, which means that I really, really apologise to the people over here who haven't had a chance to ask their questions, but, you know, we will definitely come and talk to you over the coffee break. Um, and um, I guess it's just, a, it's just a feature of this topic that there's an enormous amount to get into and lots to discuss and very, very interesting and important questions. What I'd like to do before we go over and have some coffees, just ask you to join me in thanking the panellists today for their contribution. <laughs>